Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're reading True Scary Camping Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. A few years ago, a group of friends and I went camping together. The campground we wanted to go to was full, so we ended up camping deep into the forest, several miles away from any other campers. Well, the first night we woke up at about two in the morning to drumming and singing. It sounded like a traditional Native American type of song and music. I don't know how to describe it, but I got the feeling that something was very wrong. It was like the feeling you get when something bad happens. And the sound didn't sound like it was coming from anywhere in particular, but was just all around us. Anyway, we were completely freaked out and decided to sleep in our car. The next night, we decided to see if we could find any other campers near us that might have made the noise. We literally saw no sign of life anywhere around us. And we were in a somewhat clear part of the forest. So if anyone was camped near us, we would have seen them. We were still freaked out, but decided it was probably nothing, so we spent another night. That night, we woke up at the same time again to loud music, but it sounded closer this time. We also felt like something was wrong, and were extremely freaked out. We were too freaked out to go sleep, so we just stayed in our tent awake all night. The next day when we woke up, we decided to pack up and see if the other campground was open, and it was. When we stayed, nothing else happened. To this day, I really don't have an explanation for what that noise was. I don't understand how we could have not seen any other campers, and why they would have played music in the middle of the night. We also weren't on tribal land. My best friend, who was one of the other campers, is Navajo, and she said the music was similar to the music that she heard in tribal dances and rituals. I'm still freaked out about the whole ordeal. And it's hard to explain, but my body was just telling me that something was very wrong when this was happening. I had moved back to Georgia from Southern Oregon. Don't worry, I later returned to Oregon for a while. And the city life was a cultural shock after the peace and tranquility of the remote state of Jefferson. I decided that I needed to go out in the woods for some sanity. So on Valentine's Day, I went camping up outside of Helen in the Appalachian foothills by myself. I drive as far as I could up the dirt road, maybe seven miles, until the rest of the road was closed off for winter. Nobody on the drive anywhere. Set up camp by the creek right there had a fire going, still daylight, and a truck pulled up out of nowhere on the road. Two guys, I'm a female in my 30s by the way. I hate to stereotype, but they looked like the Appalachian hillbilly part. They also had a bottle of liquor in their hand that they were drinking from. They asked why the road was closed. They peered around my campsite from inside of their truck. I'm sure noticing just one chair by the fire. I said that we are only staying for one night, and looked at the tent maybe to insinuate my man was in the tent. They left. They were creepy. It got dark and I got in my tent, and I kept thinking about those guys and I just could not shake it. I had no cell reception. I thought maybe I could sleep in my truck bed that had a camper on top. In case they came by, they would check the tent. But why would I put myself through that? So, I'm feeling defeated, because I just want some nature magic to soothe my soul. But I packed up my camp, put the embers out, and got on the road. No way would I have gotten to sleep. I pulled out of the site, and around the next corner, hours after I had seen them, they were there, in their truck. 
just waiting in the dark. They pulled out in front of my truck after starting theirs quickly and started driving down the long, windy seven miles. I had no reception. I was super scared, thinking of what I could do if they stopped. What if they ran their truck off the cliff? What if they had a gun? I made it to the main road and they took off, and I stayed in a hotel and told the hotel clerk to call the sheriff, and this was their license plate. I know that I probably narrowly escaped an R-word or death or both. Happy Valentine's Day. Good thing I never celebrate it. I'm back in Oregon, and very happy, by the way. You ain't gonna get me. Me and my friends, Mexican graphic design students, went to the Laguna Salada, Salty Lagoon, in Baja, California, Mexico, to watch the Milky Way and shoot some star trails photography. The Laguna Salada is a vast patch of salt-encrusted land that was once a lake. It dried quite a bit ago, and you can actually find ancient bleached seashells if you check carefully. Anyways, we arrive at an entrance from the highway and drive around 500 meters deep into the Salada. We come to a nice spot with a lot of bushes at one side, while clear on the other we thought this was perfect, as the bushes would block out the car headlights from the road. We stop and get out of the car. Then we all notice this strange, hissing, rattling sound all around us. Imagine being surrounded by invisible people playing maracas some far, some closer. We are so puzzled and fascinated by the sound that we start to throw out theories about what it could be. A friend says it might be echo from the cars. Other says they're insects. And another one jokingly says, alien probes man, etc. With that put aside, we set up the tripod, camera, and shutter switch. We shoot some test shots. And after everything is right, we leave the camera with the lens open to shoot the star trails. We grab some lanterns and decide to go exploring. After walking about 15 minutes, one friend says, in a very fearful voice, two men are coming at us. We are like, yeah, bro, nice try. But he repeats, not kidding. Two men are coming at us and they got assault rifles. Almost instantly, the two men yell, turn off the flashlights, turn of the flashlights now. And we're all like, he's right. We are scared and do as the men command. They get close and say, don't move, keep your hands down, don't do sudden movements. And then they start asking questions in a very aggressive tone. Who are you? What are you doing here? How old are you? What are your names? How long have you been here? Etc. After explaining ourselves, they start whispering to themselves while pointing their rifles at us. We are all frozen with fear, believing we were going to be executed right there for being at the wrong place at the wrong time. One of the men say, go back to your car and keep taking your photos, but do not go near that bush patch because, and I quote him, rifles tend to miss fire in there. As we are walking away from them, I was pretty sure we stumbled into a bunch of narcos doing some shady stuff there. I'm sure we are going to be sprayed from the back. I'm just walking slowly as our flashlights are off waiting for that hot lead to enter my back. You know how they say that your life flashes in front of you when you feel you're close to death? I can assure you it's not a lie. Past Christmas come to my mind. Me opening my sweet Super Nintendo, graduating from high school, past girlfriends, etc. I even start to get angry at life, telling myself, I'm gonna get killed by a bunch of scum narcos, all because of some photos. Thank God nothing happened. We get the message and decide to nope out of there. We decide to get out before we become another number in Mexico's narco wars. As we are all grabbing our stuff and packing up, we hear a loud rattling in the floor. A friend turns a flashlight and turns out it is a baby rattlesnake inches from my friend's feet and in attack posture with rattle shaking like crazy and all ready to strike. We cannot believe how stupid we were. All the sounds we heard in the beginning turned out to be rattlesnakes. 
all around us. Narcos and rattlesnakes. We noped out of there and never came back. A few summers ago, me and a few buddies went catfishing at a local reservoir. This is rural Ohio, and the reservoir was off a dirt road about two miles from the village that it fed, which was a village of about 1,500 people. We had fished this spot tons of times, and we very rarely saw other people during the day, and we never saw anyone out there at night. So the day we went out, it was about 9 p.m., sun's going down, we had a couple of cases of beer. We were planning on staying out until the sun came back up. We didn't want to be bothered. We weren't really allowed to have alcohol around the reservoir anyways. So we actually drove a dirt service road clear around the reservoir, as far away as we could get from the road in. This service road was nothing but compacted dirt, with tree roots running across it. Areas that had washed away during flooding, fallen trees in the road that had been there for years, etc. This place was not a well-traveled road, and the only way we got around it was that we all had lifted 4x4 trucks or jeeps. The site we pick is out on a piece of land that stretches out into the water a bit in a teardrop kind of shape. Goes maybe 20 feet out into the reservoir. So we have water on all sides of us besides our back. We figure we can fish from different directions, since we will have five or six poles in the water. It would give us a little bit more room to cast without tangling lines. Plus, there was remnants of a fire pit and some wood that was already collected. So, we go to start a fire, bait our poles and start drinking. We fish for two or three hours and get good and drunk. In the meantime, a thick summer fog creeps in across the pond. Then we hear a huge kersploosh, and we see the ripples coming from across the water to our right. There's maybe 50 yards of water between us and the other bank, and the fog was so thick, we could not see the bank or what caused the sound, but we could see the ripples in the water once they got to us. We explain it away to be a tree limb falling in the water, or maybe a beaver jumping off into the bank, and we keep fishing. About 20 minutes later, another huge kersploosh, and the ripples come again. And let me tell you, there was no mistaking the sound. It was not a fish flopping, and it was not a frog jumping in the water. It was the sound of a very large and heavy object, like the sound someone makes when they do a cannonball off the diving board. But we explained it away as we did with the first. Shortly after that, we run out of wood for the fire, so we leave one guy to watch the poles. Me and a few buddies go into the brush to find fallen sticks and whatnot. We all go our separate ways and meet back at the fire shortly after. One of my buddies comes back to the fire with a white jacket, a pair of rubber boots, and a clown mask in his arms. This was about the time when there were all the posts about the scary clowns who would lurk around towns to scare people. I knew that those stories were crap, so I figured it was just left over from some kids who had a party out there one night and left it. So we get the fire going again. We fish for a little while longer when we hear twigs breaking in the woods across the water and then another huge kersploosh. At this point, we know there is someone out there with us and the sound has to be dropping something in the water. So we call out and we say, hey, if there's someone out there, we aren't making trouble, just fishing and drinking some beers. We'd be happy to have you join us. Dead silence. So we call out again to no response. A couple of my buddies are seriously freaking out at this point, between the booze, the clown mask, the fog, and the mystery noises. So I get that drunk courage. You know the kind. And I decide that we should all go walk around the bend and see what the heck's going on. This guy's being a butthole and trying to scare us. I convince two of my buddies to come with me, and the other two guys watch the poles. So we three trek into the bush with our flashlights, make our way through thick fog, 
start working around this lake. And as we go, we start finding bits of trash and saplings that have been cut down and then more trash and then footprints of someone in their bare feet, which is odd since it was so much work to get back to this spot on the lake. No one would be hiking around this far around the lake to fish in this spot. As I'm sweeping the woods with my flashlight, I walk over the crest of a hill and not 10 feet in front of my face is a tent. This tent had been there for a long time. There was moss growing on the sides of it and there was trash and stuff thrown all around this campsite. Most concerning though was the pile of propane tanks. There had to have been 15 or 20 of these five gallon propane tanks. So we all looked at each other and said, well, guess this is none of my business. And we hurriedly made our way back to the fire, threw all of our stuff in the back of the trucks and made our way out of there in a hurry. On the way out from around the reservoir, we pulled onto the main still dirt road and passed a crappy little Toyota Camry with five dudes in it. Watching in the rear view, they pull onto the service road that we just left out of. So for those that aren't savvy in rural Southern Ohio, we busted a meth lab in the middle of the woods. The owner of said meth lab tried to scare us away by throwing stuff in the lake. I can only assume that when throwing stuff in the lake didn't scare us away, the meth cook called some of his buddies to come scare us out. Or worse yet, the meth cook called his buddies after we saw his operation. In which case, I'm glad that we got out of there before they showed up. I used to work at a Boy Scout summer camp. Every week, I had to take a big group of campers to a secluded spot for their wilderness survival badge, where they had to build a shelter out of sticks, leaves, etc., and sleep in it overnight. The spot was only about a half a mile from the main camp, but we took them a circuitous route that made it seem really secluded. Anyways, on this one night, all the campers had made their shelters. We had cooked dinner, and were all just sitting around the campfire. It was getting late, maybe 11 o'clock, so I sent all the campers to their shelters for the night and started cleaning up the fire. That's when we heard in the distance what sounded like church bells. They were pretty faint, but myself and my fellow staffers could definitely hear them. They went on for about 30 minutes, ringing every 30 seconds or so. We were all a little creeped out, as there were no churches or towns within 20 miles of us. After the bells stopped, though, the singing started. It was too faint to hear the words, but it sounded like church choir music, but a lot of people and a lot more enthusiastic. Also, it was almost midnight at this point. The singing went on for well over an hour, sometimes quieting down until we almost couldn't hear it, sometimes getting so loud that we thought it was getting closer. All of the campers were super creeped out, but I lied to them, telling them that there was a church service going on in camp that there was nothing to be scared of. Eventually, at almost 1 a.m., the singing stopped. I found out a few days later that there had been a large KKK rally only a few miles away that night. And that is the singing that we heard. I grew up down a long dirt road in rural Alabama. My family owns a decent amount of land. I still miss the peacefulness sometimes, but I'm a gamer, so I need my high-speed internet. Anyway, the first time my friend and I decided to camp by ourselves, we were about 12 years old, we picked a spot in a field that was right at the edge of the woods. We really weren't that far from the house, maybe 500, 600 yards far enough to make us feel like we were being brave, but close enough to run back to the house if needed. Everything was going fine. We had a tiny fire and plenty of junk food to gorge ourselves with. It was probably around 10 or 11 that things took a turn for the worse. 
We were both just sitting and staring at the flames. There wasn't much noise that night because it was early winter, and the bugs had pretty much vacated by that time. So all we heard was the crackling of the fire and the occasional wind gust blowing what few dead leaves might have remained on the trees. That's when we heard it. I couldn't say exactly how far away the sound was, but it came from the woods. It was a blood-curdling scream. To this day, I've never heard anything in the wild that would make you as uneasy as that sound. We both looked at each other, and I know that we were thinking, run to the house. But we were tough kids, right? So we decided we'd lock ourselves in our tent and brave this new danger we'd discovered. Neither of us had any clue what that noise was, but we knew we weren't setting a foot outside the tent until the sun came up. My friend ended up actually falling asleep an hour or so later. I didn't have an easy time, though. I could see the dying light of the fire glimmering through the tent fabric. I just laid there watching the light dance until something disturbed it. It was like the fire went out completely, but then it came back, and I immediately realized something had walked between the fire and the tent. I covered my head with my sleeping back, scared to death. I never heard a sound, no footsteps. Nothing ever messed with the food we left outside. Thirty minutes later, I had to uncover my head because I was pouring sweat and about to suffocate myself. I could still see a tiny glow from what was left of the fire. I couldn't see or hear anything else. I laid there for probably another hour before I finally fell asleep. I woke to sunlight. My friend was already up and outside. We talked about the scream and I told him what I'd seen after he fell asleep. We looked around and could see no tracks or any other signs that something else had been here besides us. It wasn't until years later and a couple of sightings from different people that we found out what actually made the sound. A panther. I went on a camping retreat with a group of friends when I was just getting out of high school. We stayed at a campground that was made up of lots of cabins that had those metal bunk beds and a large main cabin with a kitchen and a socializing area. It was the first night up there, and I wanted to take a walk around the wood near the campgrounds. I walked along some trails until I could no longer see the lights from the cabins, and it was practically pitch black. After a little while, my night vision kicked in, and I continued my exploratory hike. After about 15 minutes of walking in the dark, I could see a shape ahead of me in the path. I stopped and tried to make out what was there. About a hundred feet ahead of me was some small guy or kid standing in the middle of the path. He was standing completely still, and it appeared that he was standing in the middle of a bridge that the path led to. I stayed really quiet and started backing away while keeping my eye on him. It was way too dark for me to make out any details about him from where I was. All I could really see was that he was standing completely still. My nerve finally broke, and I hurried back to the campground. When I got back, I told my friends about what I just saw. And of course, a bunch of them wanted to head out to check out what I found. So, a bunch of us group up, and I lead them back to the bridge where I saw the guy standing. As we get closer to the spot, I could see that he was still standing in the same spot. We all kind of stopped and waited. We started whispering to one another about what we should do now. Some wanted to turn back around, and others want me to go over to him to see if he was okay. Being stupid, I agreed. I went ahead of the group and inched my way towards the figure. I was ready to bolt the moment something seemed wrong. So I got close, and when I got to the head of the bridge, I could see what the shape actually was. It was an upright vacuum. Someone had stuck an upright vacuum in the middle of a hiking path for some reason. I guess seeing something so foreign to the surroundings, along with it being completely black and white dark, made our imaginations go a bit wonky. Overall, this was pretty mundane, but the whole experience has stuck with me for decades.
So me and three of my buddies, Andy, Kurt, and Morgan, were hiking the AT over summer break. We were only going to be out three to four days doing a section in Pennsylvania. On day two, we were multiple miles into a state forest and multiple miles away from any roads or towns. As planned, we made it to a public shelter right around dinner time. It was a roof and three walls with some wooden bunks built in. We were hustling to get there as some clouds had been rolling in. We pretty much drop our bags at the shelter and it starts to rain. It was a summer rain where it blows in and pours for about 30 minutes and then blows away to reveal blue skies and sunshine. So we were glad to start building a fire and getting dinner ready. About five minutes after the rain had stopped, we hear someone coming down the trail, thinking, oh man, they must have got caught in the rain. However, first to round the trail is a happy little corgi, dry with his feet barely wet. The corgi ran up to us as we all had our snacks out and started begging for food. Behind him came a middle-aged man, slowly moving down the trail. He was wearing blue jeans, a white t-shirt, cowboy boots, had no gear with him and was also bone dry. At this point, we all start looking at each other because none of this makes sense. We nervously play with the dog for a few minutes as the man takes his sweet time making his way over to the shelter. He walks up and says hello, and doesn't really engage in any conversation. Seems a bit socially awkward, and we were all too bugged out to try and ask him questions. He came within about 10 feet of us, and was just walking around and seemed to be enjoying the scenery. We all looked at him and agreed that he was totally dry. White t-shirt and jeans. It would have been easy to tell if any of it was wet. We then say goodbye, and he starts to walk back the way that he came, started calling for the dog to follow him, saying, Toby, Toby, come on, boy. The dog had almost no reaction to these remarks. Granted, we had food, but you would expect some kind of reaction. Then I looked closer at the dog, and it was wearing a Barbie pink collar and had metal ring hanging but no dog tag attached to it. The man kept walking away and called the dog a few more times. Eventually, he disappeared down the trail. The dog stayed a few more minutes and then just walked away in the opposite direction they came from, just walked off into the woods. So once they both are gone, we start talking to each other. No one saw any hikers behind us all day. No one saw any tents or shelters set up close by. We all confirmed on our map that the closest road was miles away. We all agreed that he was dry and very strange. And we all agreed that the dog seemed to have nothing to do with him and it had a girl collar and didn't react to the name Toby. We even tried to call it Toby and it didn't react. So, as our minds race, we decide that this man must be some kind of serial killer hiding out on the trail, living off the hikers that he kills killed one with a dog and decided to keep it. From there, we formulate a plan. Andy had some paracord, and we all had tin cans left from dinner. We set up a perimeter of these noise traps around the shelter and across the front opening. We also took the wooden picnic table that was next to the shelter and tipped it up on its side against the front to try and secure us inside. Nighttime, and it's absolutely pitch black fire pit got too wet to keep something going. We all sleep on the top bunks with our knives ready to go right by our beds. None of us really slept. At the slightest noise, we would jump and then call each other's names to make sure that we were all there. I would pass out occasionally and fire off one of my grizzly bear snores and freak everyone else out. At one point, Kurt got down to look out the front and almost got stabbed by Andy as he was trying to climb back in his bunk. Then later, poor Morgan had to pee and was trying to pee out the front and accidentally hit the string and made the cans rattle. Well, the rest of us were ready to pounce on this silhouette by the front door and he had to yell, no, it's just me, it's just me. Otherwise, he would have been a goner. Eventually, we made it through the night. Sun starts to come up and we start taking down the table and traps. 
We left the note in the shelter sign and book about Toby and the man that was with him. We diverted our path and moved over near a campground the next night, set up a concealed camp quarter mile off the trail. Then, the final morning, we got to the campground, pay phones, and called in for our extraction. None of us have ever forgotten how terrifying that night was, and since then, we often recall the story of Toby and the man that was with him. I'm a little late to the party, and it's hiking instead of camping, but it still fits the theme. I'm walking along Striding Edge at Helvelin in the British Lake District. It's a quite sharp glacial arete, which involves some scrambling. It's considered a technical grade one, suitable for beginners. I'm with a mate and it's mid-afternoon. One hazard is that fog descends on the area very, very rapidly. One minute you have a low cloud and overcast skies. The next you can't see 10 yards in any direction. So it's 10 a.m. and two of us are making our first graded hike. There's a pub on the other end. We expect to make it for at latest three. We pass other hikers on the way, exchange pleasantries, and go on our way. It's ten past two when we reach the pub and we both order pie and a pint. The barkeep asks us if we've just done striding edge and we confirm we have. He then asks if we saw a blonde woman, about 35 or so, with a bright red rucksack. We confirm we have. We spent five minutes with her talking about weather conditions on the day. At around half past 11, we climbed above the dew point and into dense fog. We told her about it because we descended beyond it by the time we saw her. As best the coroner knew, we were the last to see her alive. She lost footing on a particularly narrow part of the route and tumbled over a hundred feet. It's a little chilling knowing that you were the last friendly face that someone saw before their death. My boss and his dog, colleague, and I went on this hunting-slash-camping trip in the California desert some years ago. We all had firearms, and the plan was to do a survival camping experience where we would only carry water and food for the dog and some emergency food and communication sets. We set up camp very deep inside the desert, and the nearest town was probably an hour's drive away on our 4x4 rental truck. Two days in and we haven't caught anything, and the heat is driving us crazy. On the second evening as we're out on the hunt, we see what looks like mountain lion droppings around our camp. No big deal. We've got firearms and stuff on us. We return to base empty-handed on the third evening too, and we haven't eaten solid food in three days and are just surviving on water. We start a campfire and put our heads down for some rest, and my friend sees two sets of eyes staring at us in the distance. We bring the dog and the dog goes crazy looking in the same direction as the eyes. We scramble into the tents and bring out our rifles and wait for something to happen. This standoff lasts for about 10 minutes, and we notice the animals move around a bit as we watch it. We don't fire our rifles because killing what looks like a mountain lion would invite a ton of trouble, so we just wait. At some point during this, the animals just turned around and left. I've never been more scared in my life. We packed up all of our stuff with one guy standing guard with a loaded gun at all times. We locked the doors of the car, rolled up our windows, and just left. Until today, we're convinced that it was a mountain lion. Occasionally, we think it was because we were crazed by the heat and hunger. But then, why did the dog bark? We don't know.
I recently went winter camping at a nearby state park. Had a good hike, found my campsite, and settled in for the night. The campsite was near a park road, only about 200 yards from the road, but on the other side of some trees. My tent wasn't visible from the road, which will be important later. Just as I was starting to drift off to sleep, I hear footsteps coming down the trail toward my site, and when I open my eyes, I can see a beam of light scanning the woods on the other side of the pond I'm camped by. Then the light sweeps toward me, hits my tent, and turns off. Footsteps retreat. I'm a little spooked, and by now I'm definitely making sure my knife is handy, but figure it was maybe another hiker looking for a place to camp, who saw me and turned off the light once he realized someone was already in the site. Either that, or it was the rangers checking on me. I'd filed an itinerary with them. So then I finally do drift off to sleep, only to be awoken about 30 minutes later by a vehicle coming down the trail toward my tent. I can hear it crunching on the gravel trail, steadily growing louder as it gets closer. Again, I see lights sweeping the woods across the pond, this time headlights, and again they come around the bend in the trail, shining directly onto my tent. At this point, I'm spooked. Knife in hand, I call out, Hello? When I do, the vehicle backs up, turns around, and retreats back up the trail. At this point, I'm really spooked. I call the park office and have service, thankfully. No answer. So I call 911. I tell them where I'm at, and she tells me to hold on, puts me on hold. When she comes back, she tells me that officers are in the area looking for someone. I ask if she can give me any more idea about what the problem is, so I can help. I'm an experienced backpacker and my day job is 911 operator, but she won't tell me anything. I tell her I'm a dispatcher, and if it's a missing hiker or suspect, I'll keep an eye out if she gives me the description, but she still won't tell me anything, so we disconnect. No idea who they were looking for, but I'm pretty sure it had to have been a suspect. It was the middle of winter, and I only saw one other person in the park all day. An old man walking his dog, close to the trailhead where I started. Between the cold and the incident, it was definitely my second worst night out backpacking. So I was around 19 camping with my buddy up in the mountains of North Carolina. We had hiked a few miles up a mountain from a campsite his grandparents were staying in and made a little lean-to shelter off a big rock we found near a stream. This wasn't on any trail we walked up through the stream. Everything was awesome, no worries at all. Flash forward to a little after midnight. It's really dark. Light can barely make out your hand looking up at the sky dark. The fire is nothing but coals, and I'm on the outside half of the lean-to looking out into the woods. Then, I see a light, just for a moment, mind you. So naturally, I continue to watch that same spot. A few minutes later, I see it again, pretty much in the same spot. My first thought was we had somehow gotten up close to a road on our climb, and I was seeing some headlights through the trees. While I kept watching to confirm my suspicions, when the light did some crazy flip maneuver. So either someone had a crazy wreck, or it's actually someone with a flashlight walking around in the woods in the middle of the night. So I'm just frozen, staring off into the darkness waiting for Hillbilly Joe to murder me. And my friend is just snoring gently behind me up against the rock. After about 10 minutes with no more sightings of any lights, suddenly a light appears at my feet, out of nowhere. It was an orb, maybe the size of a golf ball, I've had people say, oh, it was just a firefly, but it was white. Like, perfect light? I'm still not sure how to describe it, but it didn't seem to cast light on its surroundings. It just was light. But it went from the base of our shelter where my feet were, and moved silently in a perfectly straight line, all the way past my head, then disappeared. I am literally frozen solid now. Couldn't move if my life depended on it and for all I knew it did. About 15 agonizingly long minutes after it scanned me, or whatever, it went back to flitting around near its original spot. 
but now it wasn't going off. It just stayed on all the time. At this point, my friend rolled over in his sleep and was close enough for me to bump him with my elbow while not making any noise and keeping basically totally still. He was immediately awake and alert, thinking there could be an animal nearby. He leaned up on my back and peeked over my shoulder after I whispered, Look in the woods. After a few seconds, I heard him whisper, What the is that? I'm not crazy. It wasn't a dream. We stayed watching the light dance around for a few minutes until he turned and looked up the hill from our shelter, and there were two more lights flitting around up there. We remained awake until the sun came up watching them. They stayed until about an hour before dawn. Once the sun was up, we passed out for a few hours and then packed our stuff and left. We still don't have an explanation for what they could have been. Spirits, ghosts, aliens, mutant fireflies. I will mention that when I finally fell asleep that morning when the sun rose, I had a dream reliving it. Except this time when the light scanned me, I sat up and said, what are you? At which point it went from its perfect white over to red and flew directly into my face. I woke up at that point. Whew. That was a lot to type. Anyone else have anything like that? My cousins and I used to do a lot of camping in all seasons. One fall, we went to one of our usual places, this little ridge that made almost a bowl shape, perfect for us and our supplies. It's about a mile hike into the woods from where we parked. Well, that night, it was late, and we were all sitting around the fire, talking and smoking some weed. We can hear coyotes off in the distance. After a few minutes of hearing the coyotes sound off a few ridges away from us, we start hearing rustling from the ridge above us, and then we hear more coyotes sounding off, even closer than the first ones. The first ones sounded off again, and the rising we heard seemed intensified. They were getting excited and restless. We're all looking at each other, completely silent by this point. One of my cousins reaches behind him and grabs his gun and a big mag light. He stands up and walks to the edge of the fire's light and shines his mag light up to the ridge above us. And the eyes. All the pairs of eyes. There had to have been at least a dozen, just on that ridge. He shined the light all the way around us, and everywhere there were more eyes. In total, there had to have been three dozen coyotes, the biggest pack I have ever seen. My cousin fired off a few shots, hoping to scare them off, but they barely so much as flinched. It was a long night. We took turns sleeping in shifts, making sure that our fire never went out. The coyotes would come in closer, just feet outside of the firelight, and wait. It was maddening knowing that we were being hunted, knowing that to these animals, we were prey. Sometime before dawn, they slipped away without us noticing. My cousin said he looked up and they were just gone. There wasn't a single set of eyes left. Easily the most terrifying thing that's happened to me while camping. This will probably get lost in the mix, but I used to live on the big island of Hawaii where the current lava eruption is going on. My girlfriend and I at the time decided to go camping at McKenzie State Park along the coast in the Puna District. We had planned on staying for four nights, but ended up only staying for two nights. I had heard about it being haunted before, but sort of wrote it off and was sure not to mention this to my girlfriend. The first night, around 2 a.m., we woke up to what sounded like multiple people using a pickaxe on lava rock and groaning. This went on for what seemed like a few minutes, and then stopped. It was really weird, as there was only two other people at the park that night, 
and I was sure that they weren't using a pickaxe. We eventually fell back asleep and asked the other people the next morning if they heard it, and they had not. The second night, it was just my girlfriend and I at the park. I'm getting chicken skin right now thinking of what happened. It was around midnight when I woke up to what sounded like someone sprinting back and forth outside of our tent. Like they were sprinting back and forth at full speed. I was the only one up and turned my light on and it stopped. It freaked me out, but eventually I fell back asleep. A couple of hours later, my girlfriend is squeezing my arm and whispering directly into my ear. Someone is outside the tent. It sounded exactly like a couple of hours earlier of someone running back and forth. The corner of the tent closest to me was then lifted off the ground and shaken back and forth. We both started yelling and the tent was dropped. I immediately grabbed my light and small machete and went outside. Nothing. Nobody around. Just us in the middle of the night along the coastline. My girlfriend was panicking at this point. So we literally picked up the tent with everything in it, threw it in the back of my truck and just got out of there. After that happened, I talked to locals and said stories like this were not uncommon at all. If you look up McKenzie State Park, you'll find many different stories related to the park being haunted. We are definitely not the only ones to have heard people outside of our tent and have our tent messed with. And needless to say, we never camped there again. My best friend's parents live on this little dead-end dirt road outside of a real small town. Their house sits on a few acres of land and is mostly woods. About a half a mile down the road lives this old man who grew ginseng for a living. When I was about 16 or so, this guy named Bobby Joe went missing. He was last seen on that road where his mom dropped him off, and no one had any idea where he went. My friend and I used to walk up on those woods all the time, and there was a rumor around town that Bobby was trying to steal that old man's ginseng plants, then ran off and was hiding in the woods. So what else does a stupid teenager decide to do other than go investigate? There was a trail that we always walked on that was a good 20 minute hike from my friend's house. So we stayed on that same trail looking for any signs of someone camping out or something. All of a sudden, in the middle of the daylight, we heard a man yelling help from a distance. We just stopped and stared at each other and froze. We heard it over and over again and could still hear it from the distance, even as we were running back to his house as fast as we could. They found Bobby's body the next day, buried on that man's property. He had been shot twice, and his arm was ripped off from where his body had been removed. The old man only spent a little bit of time in jail, because he hadn't told the police up front that he killed him. Definitely one of the scariest things that has ever happened to me. I was a leader of backpacking trips in upstate New York for people ages 14 through college age individuals. Once, I was leading a group of 14 year old boys on a bushwhack, off trail hiking, navigating with a map and compass, from one trail set to another. While deep in the woods, we look up and see that we've all but walked into a pretty elaborate hunting shelter that had intense camouflage and well constructed insulated walls in a semi-permanent canvas tent. We were hesitant at first, but it looked like no one was using it, so we decided to take a closer look. The inside was pretty filled with old gear, but it also had some equipment that was in pretty good repair. We left the site after marking it on our maps to alert the rangers, as camps like that are illegal in the state park where we were hiking. After the trip, we contacted the ranger's office and they said they'd be out in the next few days to destroy it. 
Well, my friend and I knew there as a decent bit of good gear to salvage. So on our day off, we decided to hike back in and see if we could get any of the gear before it was taken by the rangers. We hiked back, following our old bearing in reverse, and found the shelter no problem. The only issue was when we got there, all the newer gear was gone. There were even rings in the dust where the camping stove had been. We turned to leave, and there was the largest buck that I have ever seen in my entire life. Nine or so points, standing, blocking our way back. The buck saw us and kind of puffs his chest out. We stood calm and tall, facing the buck for about three to five minutes that felt like hours. It starts to dip his head and make threatening sounds. So we decided to pick up some nearby sticks and wave them around, yelling, in hopes that it scares this guy away. Eventually, the buck grunted and walked away very slowly, with his chest still puffed out. The relief was wonderful. Admittedly, this didn't happen during a camping trip, but I do camp a fair bit as well. I was in Yosemite with my dad, doing a pretty strenuous five to six-ish mile hike loop up to some waterfalls while staying in a cabin within the park. So, kind of like diet camping. Maybe halfway up the cliff slash mountain slash ridge, we hear this weird raspy chirping and meowing noise. Definitely a baby animal. It sounded very close. Maybe a dozen or so yards away. We could hear it over the fairly loud gurgling of a nearby creek. My dad and I froze and looked at each other. Literally, two hours before, we saw a mountain lion, warning, and were joking about my dad fighting one off with his hiking stick. Now it was less funny because it was a distinct possibility. We walked the next mile or two with me walking backwards behind my dad, so we couldn't get ambushed in case the mother was around. We couldn't relax the rest of the hike, even though the waterfall ended up being spectacular. We get back to our cabin and look up baby cougar cries on YouTube. And yeah, that's exactly what we heard. I'm not sure how defensive those cats are of their young, but knowing there was absolutely a mountain lion within six miles of us that may want to eat us or would see us as a threat against its cubs. No thanks. I'll never forget the cold fear that I felt when I first heard those meows even though, realistically, we weren't in much immediate danger. I've had a few of what could be considered paranormal experiences in my life, but this was the most recent and unnerving. I'm an avid outdoorsman, and loved to hunt and camp around Francis Marion and Sumter National Forest. Back in 2018, I took my young son and dog out to a remote area in the National Forest to test out a new camper shell on my recently purchased truck. We found a secluded area off of a dirt road, made dinner, and then packed it in for the night as soon as it got dark. At around 11 p.m. at night, I sat up and looked out the back of the truck due to my dog growling. In the distance, I saw what looked like hundreds of small white balls of light darting around, then hovering for a few seconds and slowly converging to our campsite. They looked just like the dust orbs that you see on videos, but these were producing light in a completely dark forest. They soon surrounded my truck, seemed like hundreds of them. They were a soft white light and they didn't blink. Lightning bugs were out early evening but those were yellow and blinking. After 30 minutes of them floating around and concentrating to us, I finally worked up the nerve to open the truck and lit a lantern, and they promptly disappeared. After turning off the lights and locking back up, they came back. My son was fast asleep, thank goodness. 
I watched them until I finally fell asleep around 1 a.m. The next morning when we tried to leave, the battery was dead on the new truck. There wasn't any lights in the back cab where we would have used any power. A week later, I had to replace the electric control module. Not sure if that was relevant info, but I thought I would add it. Has anyone had a similar experience? Just thinking about them again makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.